What's up guys, we're back with another educational video and this week we are talking about protein intake and healthy aging. But first, you know the drill, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment Follow the algorithm. So a new study came out published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition looking at protein intake and then different kinds of protein intake and its effects on healthy aging. And healthy aging was defined as being free from chronic diseases, including, and I'm reading off the paper, cancer, except for non-melanoma skin cancer, type 2 diabetes, myocardial infarction, coronary artery bypass graft surgery, or percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, congestive heart failure, stroke, kidney failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, and ALS. But basically, some of the major diseases that are the cause of not just death, but also drastically impaired lifestyle during aging. So the study wasn't really looking at longevity, it was more looking at what we call health span. As people age, are they healthy or not? And so they looked at these diseases and they also uh, assessed healthy aging as not having impairments in either cognitive or physical function and having good mental health. So. I think that's pretty cool that they included all those things in this bucket. Now, this was a cohort study of about 50,000 people, and they followed them for about 30 years. So a pretty long time. The average age in the study was 48 years old when they started. So by the end, uh, the average age is going to be in the 70s. Now, I want to compliment the authors because they did do a good job using different multivariate models, also try to covariate out a lot of different confounding variables now, again, as I've talked about many times, you can't covariate out everything. Covariate is where you attempt to control for confounding variables. It's just not possible to covariate everything out. But it's a cohort study, large population of people, long time. There's not going to be a high level of control. What was very interesting is across the board for protein intake, protein intakes that were higher were associated with healthier aging. And they looked at four different quartiles of protein intake. And just using absolute gram amounts, protein intake at the lower quartile was about 57 grams on average, or 58 grams. And at the highest quartile was about 90 grams. Not a huge difference. And in terms of percent of calorie intake, it was from 14% of calories all the way up to 23% of calories. The lower end is what we'd call kind of your normal protein intake. It's right in line with the dietary guidelines. Up to 23% would be considered high protein. And a lot of people have made claims that protein could contribute to various diseases like cancer, heart disease. I mean, this study doesn't really support that because people who were eating higher protein intakes had lower rates of these. Now, I want to point out a few confounding variables just because it's important to point these out. And remember, I have a bias towards high protein. I'll freely admit that. I think high protein diets have a lot of utility. I think they're very important for healthy aging. My research was on high protein diets. That is my bias. I'm being upfront with it. Some confounding variables are people with higher protein intakes actually had progressively lower energy intake. So the average energy intake amongst low protein intake was about 1900 calories a day. The average intake amongst the highest protein intake was about 1,570 calories. That's a pretty big difference. I mean, you're looking at like well over 300 calorie difference, but you could call it a confounding variable. It is, but we also know that protein has some satiety benefits. And so this could be a function of protein having a benefit of satiety. Now you could also argue people who are eating higher protein may be prone to other health promoting behaviors. And in fact, they did see progressively reduced alcohol intake as protein went up. So again, you can't covariate out all these confounding variables. What I thought was very interesting is they did an analysis where they substituted various macronutrients with either total protein, animal protein, dairy protein, or plant protein versus uh, total carbohydrate, refined carbohydrate, carbohydrates from whole grains, total fat, saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat and monounsaturated fats and looked at, you know, did the substitution favor protein or not favor protein? Some of the effects weren't significant, but I gotta be honest, when you look at the forest plots, it almost favors protein with every single one. The one nutrient that total protein, animal protein, and dairy protein were either the same as or a little bit worse than was polyunsaturated fats. So sorry, seed oil, demonizers, uh, polyunsaturated fats were the only ones that came out looking good in this study. 
uh, compared to protein at least. Plant protein had beneficial effects in substitution for all of these things. So, and in fact, it was pretty powerful. I'm gonna talk about that here in a second. But basically for any of these nutrients, Substituting protein either had a neutral or positive effect. You could argue like on the animal side, polyunsaturated fats were better to substitute in place of animal protein, but the effect wasn't significant. It's either a neutral or positive effect when substituting total protein, animal protein, dairy protein, or plant protein for these various nutrients, including whole grains, monounsaturated fats, which are thought to be healthy. And again, I'm not saying these other things aren't healthy. What I'm saying is, Protein in particular seemed to have a beneficial effect on healthy aging when substituted for most of these other nutrients. Now, let's get to the different types of protein. When looking at the effects of total protein, the odds ratios for every 3% increment of protein intake was 1.05, which basically means for every 3% increase in total protein intake, there was a 5% increase in the possibility of healthy aging, meaning that they were free from all these conditions we talked about. If we go back to thinking about the 14% intake of protein versus 23% intake in protein, we're looking at a 15% greater probability that those people eating the higher intake of protein, the highest intake of protein, would age healthier than the bottom quartile. Then if we break it into the specific types of protein, every single type of protein had beneficial effects. For each 3% increase in animal protein, there was a 7% beneficial effect, meaning if you increase your energy intake from animal protein by 3%, you get a 7% reduction in the risk of developing these diseases or a 7% increased likelihood that you will fall under the category of healthy aging. Now, if we look at dairy, the effect was more powerful. It was a 14% benefit for each 3% increase in energy from dairy protein. And if we look at plant protein, very powerful, a 38% relative increase in benefit for every 3% increase in plant protein intake. And again, if we look at these uh, forest plots, plant protein showed a benefit for every single nutrient it got substituted for, and, and pretty powerful to that effect. This will probably lead some people to say, well, focus on just getting a lot of plant protein in. I think eating plant protein is a great idea, but I'm not convinced it's that the protein itself has something spectacularly beneficial about it. The amino acids from plants, when they're broken down, are still just amino acids. Now you can argue, well, plant protein has less leucine, leucine activates mTOR, that's gonna cause all these problems. I don't think that's why plant protein has this association. One thing they didn't control for was dietary fiber. Plant protein is gonna have by far more dietary fiber than other sources of protein, which are basically devoid of fiber. So if you're eating more plant protein, you're eating more fiber by default. And what do we know about fiber? For every 10 gram increase in fiber, there is a 10% decrease in the risk of cardiovascular disease, the risk of cancer, and the risk of mortality. I think that this is likely explained by the fact that people eating more plant protein are eating more fiber. But that being said, there's no downsides to eating some plant protein. Now, do I think everybody needs to go out and buy like soy protein and uh, pea protein and rice protein compared to whey protein or something like that? I don't think that's gonna make a difference. Really, I, I just don't. I think that what you're seeing is an effect of the overall source of the food. Animal protein gonna be higher in fat, higher in saturated fat, whereas plant protein is gonna be higher in if it has any fat, it's gonna be polyunsaturated fat. It's gonna be higher in dietary fiber, insoluble and soluble. And there's gonna be micronutrients associated with those plant proteins that may have beneficial effects on inflammation and oxidation and those sorts of things. My overall take home from this is that one, protein is not this evil nutrient that people have made it out to be. Two, it may be important for healthy aging. And in fact, one of the biggest detrimental effects during aging is sarcopenia. In fact, after age 65, you can tie many, many, many deaths back to a lack of muscle mass and especially inability to live a healthy end of your life. People don't want to think about this kind of stuff because they just, I guess they think when they get to be 70, all of a sudden they just won't care about how they feel. Uh, Ask 70 year olds if they care about how they feel. I promise you they do care. Trying to build and maintain more lean mass and strength is gonna be beneficial for not just your longevity, 
but also your quality of life. My take home is protein, good for healthy aging. Animal protein appears to have a neutral, slightly positive effect on that. Dairy protein, neutral or positive effect. And plant protein, positive effect. Get a wide variety of protein sources. Include plant protein as part of that. You can include animal protein as part of that. If you choose to, I wouldn't really be worried about protein. Literally, almost all the research showing protein to be bad is mechanistic in nature in animal models, oftentimes in knockout models that are genetically altered, or it's connecting random dots through epidemiology and torturing data apart. Now you could say, well, Lane, this is epidemiology. It is, but I got to tell you, they did a pretty darn good job controlling for a lot of variables here. It was a long follow-up and it was a lot of people. So I do give this study uh, more weight. Again, if protein, even animal protein, was so bad, why do people who have less risk of having lower quality of life as they get older and being at risk for these diseases, why are they better off just slightly consuming more animal protein? For the hypothesis that protein is uniquely bad to be true for health, it is hard to reconcile with the results of this study. And again, it's just one study, but again, couple this with the data we have on people who eat high protein diets in terms of the randomized control trials, really not seeing any detrimental effects on health. I think there is good evidence to suggest that you don't need to really worry about protein too much uh, if you're eating a higher protein diet. Now, again, they didn't examine intakes of, you know, 150, 200 grams a day or some of these high intakes that people like me have. But again, I just look at the randomized control trials, which have shown even up to like two grams per pound of body weight for a year really didn't show any deleterious effects on any measurable health markers in human randomized control trials. All right, guys, if you liked the video, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you guys next week.